intent really is to make sure that we all have a common foundation going forward um, to understand what the Commission was all about because that's always a question what what is the TRC about and I think people need to have an appreciation for that but in addition uh, I think people also need to have an appreciation for what the Commission did and how we gathered the information to make the findings, conclusions, and recommendations or calls to action, as we uh, refer to them um, in our report. So it begins with um, recognizing that uh, the course of the work of the TRC, it became very clear that the most common question that we were getting throughout our uh, period of time, uh, but particularly early on, was uh, how come we never knew any of this? And most people were asking us, why weren't we told about this? And um, but there's no easy answer to that, but one straightforward answer that most people, um, I think, get a grasp on is that it was <coughs> never considered important enough from a Canadian perspective that this be included in anybody's educational, whether school education or public educational um, experience. So as a result, even when there were opportunities to learn about it, uh, it was never conveyed. Early on, for example, um, we, in searching the documents that we had in our possession from the beginning, found uh, that in the archives of Canada, copies of uh, several hundred letters to the editor that were written by various people across the country throughout the existence of residential schools complaining about what they had heard was happening to the kids in the schools, the abuse that was happening, the uh, physical harm that was being caused, and the way the children were being treated, and the way the parents were being treated. And those letters to the editor were written primarily to uh, newspapers. And we uh, met with a number of uh, editorial boards for major newspapers across the country, particularly those that go back into the 19th century and uh, I'm not going to use names, but you can figure out which ones that would include. And we, uh, after answering their questions, which is what editorial board meetings are all about, we asked them, would you give us access to your archives so that we can see what you did with those letters to the editor that you received? Because in none of the media did we find any stories by media outlets about what was going on in residential schools and not one of them allowed us access to their archival materials. But we do have copies of the correspondence because many of those letters, of course, were copied to MPs, to cabinet ministers, and to various other government officials that uh, found its way into the archives of Canada, which after a certain effort on our part, we were able to get access to. So this story that I'm about to uh, tell you a bit about uh, comes from a considerable effort on the part of the survivors as well as the Commission to uncover the truth around around uh, residential schools in order for us to be able to talk about the impact the schools have had not only upon those who were there but also upon those who were not there and in particular upon Canada and uh, what the impact will likely be going forward because that will inform us about what we need to do if we want to achieve the end result of reconciliation, however we might understand that. The, what's important to remember is that um, Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people in this country have been in a, a relationship for a long period of time. This is not just a story about the last 150 years. Uh, Confederation is going to be celebrating its uh, 150th anniversary next year in, 18, in, in 2017. Uh, Confederation occurred in 1867, as you all know. But this relationship uh, between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in this country, the Indigenous people and the government entities as they existed throughout the history of this country, have been in place for uh, 500 years, literally since the first explorers arrived back in 1491, 1492, in that era. And so we all always need to know and need to keep in mind that when we talk about 
the relationship between indigenous and non-indigenous people, we have to analyze it going back that far and even further because, of course, there had been earlier contact and there had been stories of earlier contact. And we also, quite frankly, have to be aware of the nature of the contact that was going on and the relationship that existed in, in southern parts of North America as well as in Central and South America as well because the amount of information that was being shared through indigenous messaging systems such as they existed about what was going on in Central America and Mexico and in South uh, America was much uh, better than people appreciate. It wasn't that there was isolation between the North and the South, there was a considerable amount of communication that was going on. And so those messages uh, were known here as to what was happening in the South, for example. So we need to, to keep that in mind as we go forward. But let's talk about the era from Confederation because that's the era of residential schools as we've come to understand it and as we've discussed in our report for the TRC. Uh, education was always considered important to indigenous people, um, particularly after Confederation, before Confederation as well, but it was uh, offered as a voluntary process from the church groups primarily. There were residential schools that existed going back into the 1600s in um, what is now Quebec, offered by the missionary societies. Uh, but those school board uh, offerings that were made and positions that were offered were always on a voluntary basis. There was very little in the way of coercion that occurred to require attendance at those schools. But since Confederation, uh, uh, education became important to the indigenous groups in Western Canada because that was the era of Canadian expansion into the West. And so as a result, the um, issue of education became raised uh, very early on in, in those discussions, particularly when treaty negotiations were taking place. If you look at the treaties of Western Canada, uh, treaties 1 through 10, uh, you'll see, in fact, that there's a schools clause in every treaty. For the first five or six treaties, the schools clause is virtually identical, in which uh, the government promises to build schools on the reserves that are established by the treaty. Uh, and in the latter part of the treaty negotiations, the government maintains unto itself a discretion as to whether or not they'll build the school. But in the early part, it was the First Nation negotiators who were insisting on schools being built in their communities from the record of the treaty negotiations as we, as we find them because they wanted their children to be educated. They wanted their children to receive training which would allow them to participate in this new society that they were becoming partners in. And the treaty negotiation discussions were consistently about First Nations people and Canadian negotiators coming into this new partner relationship of um, setting a, a, a different path for themselves and each had been experienced to, the, in, to that point in time. So education was important. In fact, Treaty Number 1 was drafted in Ottawa and was carried out to the negotiations by the treaty negotiators and it didn't have a schools clause. and had to be rewritten in order to put a schools clause in it because the First Nations negotiators insisted on a schools clause being inserted. But Sir John A. Macdonald had a different idea. Um, in 1883, uh, following uh, discussions between himself and members of his cabinet, as well as, we think, probably private interests, including church groups, um, he said this in Parliament, and this is on the record in um, May of 1883, in which he says that uh, if they built schools on the reserves, then the children are going to be living with their parents, and the parents are really nothing more than savages, he said. Uh, he is surrounded by savages, and though he may learn to read and write, his habits and training and mode of thought are Indian. He is simply a savage who can read and write. So there was a movement among the survivors to get t-shirts made up, <laughs> saying, I'm a savage who can read and write. Uh, but the, uh, the attitude that this statement reflects was conveyed to of course, all of the leading officials of the Canadian government at the time, as well as other officials within society, and it became the message that uh, justified, in fact, the schools themselves. 
And when you look at uh, a photograph like this, for example, which is a photograph of a young Indian boy by the name of Thomas Moore, who's dressed on the left side as a young savage Indian boy, and on the right side he's dressed as a civilized Indian boy. Uh, this was a part of a propaganda process that the government engaged in. This is a posed photograph that uh, was deliberately used by government and church representatives to show the beneficial impact that residential schools were going to have. And we know it's posed from the information that we gathered around the photograph, but if you look at the, the picture itself, you'll see that in the left-hand photograph, young Thomas is holding a six-gun, not a toy that a lot of uh, Indian boys were playing with at the time. But in addition to that, his, his dress, his manner of dress, is an amalgam of various different tribal dress, dresses. So he's not, uh, he's not dressing in accordance with any particular tribal manner of dress. So this is literally, they threw on him whatever they could find in order to pose him for that photograph. But this photograph is reflective of uh, hundreds if not thousands of photographs that were taken around that time to show the beneficial impact of missionary work, of church work, of uh, residential schools and boarding schools in the United States as well. And so this became the means by which the schools were sold as an idea to the Canadian public. And so the Canadian public was essentially being told, this is a good thing. This is a good thing. We're going to take these children and we're going to place them into institutions and we're going to take the savage from them and we're going to replace it with a civilized uh, essence of being uh, through Christianization. And the role of schools, in fact, the role of churches in the schools became very important. And so this became the means by which the schools were sold as an idea to the Canadian public. And so the Canadian public was essentially being told, this is a good thing. This is a good thing. We're going to take these children and we're going to place them into institutions and we're going to take the savage from them and we're going to replace it with a civilized uh, essence of being uh, through Christianization. And the role of schools, in fact, the role of churches in the schools became very important. And it was recognized that removing children from their families for the purpose of education and indoctrination in this way was a bit controversial, but as this quote from Hector Langevin in 1883 during the same debate, and that debate was about funding the schools incidentally because it was the first year that the government of Canada set up uh, a process by which they would pay for the schools. Um, in this quote, uh, you can see that in order to civilize them, the only thing we can do is take them away from their parents. So the idea of civilizing them, beating the savage out of them or removing the savageness from them was really key. And the churches quickly became involved because it fit right into their concept of missionary work, proselytization, saving souls, bringing God to the people. And uh, the numbers on the top left of this photo will tell you that uh, uh, the number of church, uh, church schools that were run in Western Canada, uh, or throughout the country rather, where uh, Roman Catholic schools were about 60%. In Western Canada, they were about 80%. Anglican schools, 22%. United and Presbyterian schools, about those numbers. There were other Christian groups that were involved in running schools as well. Mennonites ran a couple of schools. Baptists ran a few schools. Uh, but those were the larger congregations that you see in this photograph. In this particular photo, uh, was a photo of students after they had been taken to the schools by Indian agents or government agents um, to be educated there. And, and as you can tell, it's a Catholic school. But life in the um, schools was not as glamorous as that first photo shows. This is a photo that uh, reflected a number of other photos that we found, and it shows mealtime at a particular school and we found uh, lots of photos which showed, in fact, that the schools were largely deprived of funding, adequate funding, and that life for the children was very hard in the schools. In fact, they were poorly nourished, they were poorly dressed, they had their, their own clothing taken away from them when they arrived at the schools, and they had to wear clothing that was distributed to them by the schools itself, and sometimes 
the schools could only give them hand-me-downs and did, couldn't give them adequate clothing even for the weather. And as you can see from this uh, particular uh, photograph, when you hear survivors talking about the fact that they felt like the schools were really like jails, you can see why that image is so strong with many of the um, survivors. And a lot of the letters that uh, were sent to public officials in the early part of the existence of the schools were complaining about conditions like this, that the children were not being properly provided for and not being properly nourished and properly taken care of. Um, abuse of the children uh, takes many forms, of course, um, and here's just some of the things that we found both in the documents and in the testimony from survivors who spoke to us. Uh, and of course, just from what we knew about how the schools were established, separation of the children from their families, from their traditional way of life, from their community, was an important feature of the schools. Letters and tra documents show that the churches were constantly concerned about putting children into the schools and then letting them go back to their communities where they would be re-influenced by their paganistic and heathenistic families. And so there was a movement by the churches to keep the kids in the school for longer and longer periods of time. And some children, in fact, never were allowed to go back to their home communities until they reached the maximum age that the law required them to remain in the schools. My grandmother, for example, was taken from her family and placed in a residential school and, and near her community um, and never left it until she married my grandfather. Catholics established a policy that women, young girls, when they were leaving the school, had to marry another Christian boy before they could leave so that they wouldn't go home and raise pagan children. Um, so she, uh, she married my grandfather, uh, who incidentally was not a Catholic. She was a Catholic. Uh, he was close to a pagan because he was an Anglican, <laughs> as my grandfather was always reminded by my grandmother. Um, but uh, they stayed married for 63 years and they had 13 kids, so obviously things worked out for them, uh, but the, um, the reality for the children was that their life and their life decisions were not always made by those who were closest to them, which was their mothers and fathers and other family members. Children were emotionally abused from the moment they, they arrived, of course. They were, they were um, told that they were inferior, they are told that they were heathens, they were savages, their hair was cut, their um, clothes were removed anything that their families sent with them, uh, any cultural objects were removed from them, so that they were totally isolated and kept away from anything that would suggest that they had a previous life that was worthy of being retained. Uh, children were physically abused. Um, right from the beginning, children complained to their families and to others about being physically disciplined and uh, harshly disciplined upon arrival in the schools. Uh, right into the 1880s, um, and some of the early letters were about that. Um, and in fact, we found copies of court applications by parents applying to court to get their children taken out of the school uh, because of the way that they were being treated. And some of those early applications were successful until the government amended the law to make it impossible for Indians to go to court. Uh, but sexual abuse also began occurring quite frequently early on within the schools. The first document that we've come across that documented a sexual abuse incident was from 1888, but it's quite likely it was going on before then. But the, uh, throughout the entire history of the school, there's many documents which show uh, that sexual abuse was quite rampant in the schools. Schools were generally overcrowded, so there were far too many children in some of the schools than there were beds for. Some of the schools also suffered from undercrowding. In other words, there were too many beds and not enough children. And so there's correspondence from church groups that were running schools complaining that more um, effort had to go into rounding up children to bring them into the schools so that the churches that were running the schools could get more money. Because uh, they got a per, per capita grant for uh, each child that was in the school. So you had some schools that suffered from overcrowding and some that suffered from low numbers. Uh, so there was um, 
a very poor management oversight by the, the government to ensure that there was a balanced approach to that. Uh, poor sanitation occurred within the schools. Lots of schools suffered from not having uh, adequate uh, toilet facilities, um, adequate amounts of water, good water supplies so the children could wash regularly. Uh, food was poorly prepared, poorly handled in many cases, and many times there was inadequate amounts of food. Unhealthy and limited diets. We found documents by government health officials complaining about the way the children were being fed. And remember, from the government's perspective, they built the schools, they re gathered the children up, and they took the children there, and then they would put in place rules about how the children were to be treated and what was to happen to them, and they would check on the schools from time to time, but they largely left the day-to-day -day operation in the hands of the churches. And the churches received per capita grants for the operation of the school, which they would then use to pay for some of the school costs, but um, in the case of the Catholic schools, we know that there was an annual fee that each of the schools had to send to the local diocese in order to fund the work of the diocese. So the schools were being used by the church uh, organizations, by Catholic organizations as well as others, to pay for some of their ongoing uh, church-based work. Uh, medical care within the schools was poor. Uh, many of the children suffered from uh, illnesses that could easily have been prevented and could easily have been treated, uh, but uh, was not because there were not uh, regular health officials in place. And when they did, when the government did uh, undertake to provide health services for the schools, uh, it was usually provided by people who couldn't function as health providers in regular society. So there's lots of situations of people who couldn't make it as medical doctors in society who were hired by the government to provide health services in residential schools. Um, children, of course, were punished for speaking their language, and if there was any effort on their part to practice their culture or any sense of spirituality based upon their traditions, they'd be physically punished for that. Lots of examples in the testimony of children who were physically stripped naked in front of the entire school if they were caught speaking their language and were beaten in front of other students as a lesson to them. So I've always said throughout uh, the work of the Commission that those students who would come forward and say that they were never physically uh, disciplined or physically harmed while in the schools, um, that uh, people would point to that as evidence that the schools didn't abuse everybody or even a substantial number of students. The reality is that if they weren't physically abused, they lived in fear of being physically abused or disciplined. Uh, and all survivors will talk about the fact that they didn't, they didn't want it to be them next. So, so it was a, a constant sense of oppression. Children had to work in order to keep the schools operating. They only went to classes for half a day it was called a half-day system, in fact, it got an official government name. And the government direction was, uh, you only have to educate them for half a day, but you have to put them to work for the other half of the day because you have to grow your own food or find your own income to buy the food that the school needs and pay for those expenses. So children would be, um, I'm not sure what, rented out, I guess, to farmers nearby or to businesses nearby in order to work for them and the money from the, what they earned would be given back to the school. And the same with young girls would be working as domestics in, in town or in a nearby house and um, the income that they would earn would go into the school's fund. Um, so children were not particularly well educated for the first 50 or 60 years that the schools were in operation. There was actually no standard uh, requirement for curriculum and there was no requirement that children in fact had to be educated by people who were certified as teachers. Uh, teacher certification did not become a requirement until after about 1930. And uh, siblings were separated uh, from each other at school, so brothers, older brothers, younger brothers, brothers and sisters, older sisters, younger sisters were all separated in order to keep them from speaking their traditional language to each other while at the school. And um, early on, the um, 
uh, residential school system became established because of the work of uh, people like uh, uh, Ryerson and others like him who recommended a process of public education for young children in the colonies. Uh, but uh, Egerton Ryerson, who is considered to be kind of the, the father of public education in Canada, specifically said that children cannot be Indian children cannot be expected to uh, f be able to function in the school system as well as white children can be, so that they should only receive an education which will allow them to develop menial labor skills. So he really believed in the English system of common education versus the higher public education and that uh, Indian children would only receive those skills that they needed to be able to provide services to other people. The graduation, the Gradual Civilization Act uh, was passed in, in Upper Canada in 1857 which basically was intended to do away with separate identity and separate culture so it was the beginning of cultural oppression uh, as uh, using schools for cultural oppression in 1857 the government of Canada in the 1870s, of course, established a residential school system and uh, with the focus that Sir John A. Macdonald brought to it in 1883. Attendance way became compulsory for all children between the ages of 7 and 15 in 1920 when they amended the Indian Act to make it compulsory for all children to attend. And at the height of the residential school activities in 1931, there were 80 residential schools operating at the same time throughout Canada. Um, and the numbers that we're going to use in this presentation are really only about the schools that are listed in the residential school settlement agreement. Um, there were, um, uh, you can see uh, uh, later on, 130 different school locations that are identified in the settlement agreement that was a subject of litigation against the government of Canada, but there were uh, probably 1,400 schools operating throughout Canada, many of them run by other entities such as provinces, churches, uh, territorial government uh, that were not subject to litigation because the government of Canada was able to maintain that they were not legally responsible for them. 80% of the schools were west of Ontario and over time, as I said, there were 130 different school locations in Western Canada that were established. Uh, churches officially were kicked out of the school business in 1969 when the government decided to cut its losses. By then the schools were a huge financial burden for the government of Canada so they decided in 1951 to start closing down residential schools. Uh, and that was resisted for about 20 years by the churches who still saw it as a means by which they could uh, earn money and continue their missionary work. But finally the government in 1969, um, at the same time they issued the white paper of 1969, uh, kicked all the churches out of operating residential schools. Uh, residential schools continued to operate though until 1996. Many of them uh, being operated by tribal entities, so local school boards established by bands or by tribal councils continue to operate residential schools. We talked of course to many people who were students in the schools but we also talked to staff who worked in the schools and we looked at the journals and records of staff who worked in the schools because we wanted to ensure that their perspective was also reflected in our report. And uh, you can see that uh, other than, of course, those who were known to be abusive and abusers within the schools, that the staff who taught in the schools were, uh, were not treated very well themselves. Um, they were responsible for supervising the education, but also while the child and the children were at work, while they were playing and in their personal care, so much more than a teacher would normally be expected to do. The uh, working hours for the teaching staff in the schools were quite long and they were paid at a salary far below what they would have been able to earn in the public school system in Canada. And the working conditions, they constantly talked about how exasperated they felt that the needs of the children were not being met despite their constantly bringing them to the attention of government officials. And uh, a lot of people left the residential schools to go work elsewhere out of that frustration. And uh, they didn't have to be certified until 
um, the 1950s. So they they weren't uh, professionally trained or professionally certified as teachers. Um, and the certification process was a legal requirement in most provinces going back into the 1920s and 1930s. So the, um, the treatment of uh, uh, the establishment and, and running of residential schools uh, were quickly seen as a violation of treaties. In fact, a lot of the early correspondence was written by lawyers and people on behalf of First Nations complaining about the fact that the residential schools were a violation of the schools clauses that were in the treaties. Uh, efforts were made uh, by the government, though, to prevent those issues from being brought to light. So they prevented chiefs from attending any meetings to coordinate political activity. They passed an amendment to the Indian Act in 1883, which made it an offense for three or more Indians to gather together in order to discuss a complaint against the government of Canada. It was called an Indian conspiracy, and uh, so any three or more Indians who gathered together for that purpose were guilty of an offense and could be punished for doing that. They created the Indian Pass system, which required that all Indians who were leaving the reserve or needed to, wanted to leave the reserve, had to get a written pass from the Indian agent before they could leave. If they were found outside of the reserve without a pass, they could be detained by the police and held in custody and then returned. They couldn't be prosecuted because even though they referred to them as pass laws, there was actually no legislation in place that justified or enabled the passes to be issued or required that they had to be obtained. But the police and the government of Canada uh, participated in a process of infringing on the rights of movement of individuals by creating this simply through administrative fiat. Uh, spiritual ceremonies uh, were banned, uh, so it became illegal to participate in any kind of traditional spiritual ceremony, the sweat lodges, the pot latches, the sun dances, all of those um, ceremonies that were very important to the maintenance of traditions and language and culture were all prohibited by law. actually became an offense to wear Indian garb if you were an Indian within the meaning of the Indian Act. If you were not an Indian within the meaning of the Indian Act, you could dress up like an Indian, but if you were not so free, then um, if you were governed by the Indian Act, you were prohibited by law from dressing up as an Indian. There's a case, in fact, from Rivers, Manitoba, 1927, where the chief of Sioux Valley and the members of his tribe were invited by the, the town of Rivers, Manitoba, to participate in a Canada Day parade by dressing up in their regalia and riding their horses in the parade. And the parade was stopped by the police and the RCMP arrested the chief and his members for wearing Indian garb. Um, uh, going to court became impossible. In 1927, they uh, passed an amendment to the Indian Act which, allowed, which outlawed the um, raising of money to pursue a, a land claim. They outlawed uh, in, uh, lawyers from giving any legal advice to Indians about a claim that they might have, unless they got permission from the Minister of Indian Affairs first. They prohibited anybody from going to court to sue the government of Canada for a land claim unless they got permission from the government of Canada first. And uh, in the five million records that we've looked at, we've never found anybody who got permission to sue the government of Canada. Uh, people talk about the fact that Indians didn't have the right to vote. They actually had the right to vote for six years in 1885 as part of the civilization idea, as part of an encouragement to give, get Indians to give up their status and become um, members of society. They were given the incentive of being allowed to vote, but they had to, to um, enfranchise and they had to own property, and it was only men, of course, who were allowed to vote at that time. Uh, but that right was taken away in 1891 through an amendment to the uh, Indian Act, interestingly called the Indian Advancement Act, uh, which also removed the power of traditional chiefs and council and said only those governing councils that were elected in accordance with rules established under the Indian Act were allowed to exercise any authority. Um, and in 1962, of course, the um, voting laws were changed to allow Indians to vote.
So uh, this chart shows you where residential schools are located. You'll see in British Columbia there were 18 schools located throughout the province. Uh, Alberta had 25, Saskatchewan had 20, Manitoba had 14, and the rest. And again, these are only the schools that are listed in the settlement agreement. There were other schools. For example, the Catholic Church established a number of schools for Métis children that um, are not listed in the settlement agreement and particularly in Saskatchewan and Alberta, and those schools um, will probably be the subject of more litigation to come. Uh, but these are only the schools that are listed in the settlement agreement. So the vast majority of those schools are listed in, and uh, were located in Western Canada. Uh, survivors, uh, the population distribution of survivors you can see here are also primarily in Western Canada. Uh, the vast majority of survivors were from the three prairie provinces, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, with Saskatchewan having the largest numbers. And it's because Saskatchewan ran residential schools for the longest period of time. The last residential school closed in 1996 in Saskatchewan. So just by the process of time, uh, there were more survivors alive uh, when the settlement agreement was signed in 2006. And um, so that's why there were more survivors uh, who made claims. The common experience payment is a payment that was made to each survivor who was alive at the date of the, uh, the uh, arrival of the settlement agreement and uh, entitled to claim an amount for having been in the schools. The issue of apology and um, the beginning of reconciliation uh, with apology has been documented in our report. Uh, so we see, for example, that the United Church of Canada issued a, a broad apology in 1986 simply for participating in cultural oppression and cultural denial. In 1998, they made an apology specific to having run uh, residential schools. The um, Oblates of Canada uh, issued a full apology in 1991. Anglican Church issued one in 1993. Presbyterian Church issued an apology in 1994. Expressions of sorrow were issued by the Pope in um, Pope Benedict in 2009. You probably are aware of the visit uh, Phil Fontaine had with him. And uh, Canadian Catholic Women, so the, the organization that oversees uh, sisters, uh, Catholic sisters in Canada, issued an apology in 2009. Um, but there hasn't been a full apology from the Catholic Church uh, per se other than the expression of regret and sorrow that was issued. So the settlement agreement uh, that I've been referring to was uh, officially put in place in 2007. It was negotiated and signed in principle back in 2005. Um, in 2006 the ratification process began was fully ratified uh, by the fall of 2006 and uh, it created a, a series of parties to the settlement agreement. So they included the um, Assembly of First Nations, the Inuit uh, as representing the plaintiffs, the Government of Canada, United Church, Anglican Church, Presbyterian Church and 54 Roman Catholic entities uh, were all identified as defendants in the settlement agreement and the settlement agreement put an end to all the litigation involving those parties for those schools that are listed in the settlement agreement, created a fund from which uh, uh, compensation payments were made, and there were two forms of compensation. The common experience payment was paid to more than 79,000 eligible survivors, and in order to be eligible you had to be alive at a certain date in May of 2005, and you received $10,000 for the first year or part of the year that you were there in residential school plus $3,000 for each year thereafter regardless of what happened to you and if you uh, were harmed in any way through abuse uh, then you were entitled to go to what was called the independent assessment process where adjudicators would uh, listen to the evidence relating to what happened to you and you were allowed to bring proof of the damage that you sustained and then you were awarded an amount uh, out of a fund that initially was about two billion dollars but uh, grew to just over four billion dollars.
and the last of those claims are likely to be heard and resolved by 2017, we're told, although I'm not sure that that's true unless they put a big push on because there's a substantial number of claims still waiting to be resolved. Uh, of the 79,000 CEP claimants, about 38,000 of them, so just under half of them, have made claims for injuries to the independent assessment process. A commemoration fund was created of $20 million. It was set aside for community initiatives, so community uh, healing initiatives. Uh, the vast majority of applications came from British Columbia, I think largely because they were the best organized province for the commemoration fund. Uh, but uh, the um, TRC was given responsibility to re uh, as to which uh, projects were to be funded. And the Commission itself received $60 million out of the compensation fund for its operation. And with extensions that uh, came over uh, about to about $80, $80 million altogether. So the TRC's mandate was to investigate and report upon the truth uh, of, of residential schools and report on the legacy the schools have established. Uh, we did that through statement gathering and document collection largely, as well as research, of course. Uh, our obligations also extended to educating the public. And uh, to do that, we hosted seven national events across the country, and we held a, quite a number of community events. We funded uh, commemoration initiatives. I told you about the $20 million fund that uh, was established. We also funded community events uh, for communities that wanted to undertake their own initiatives. And we issued a public report with recommendations in 2012. The uh, public report was called They Came for the Children. Uh, plus we issued a final report in 2015. And we were also mandated to set up a national research center uh, as a permanent legacy to house all of the work and the results of the work and that is currently housed at the University of Manitoba in the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. Some of the areas that um, we were not mandated to <coughs> explore but which became a very clear issue right at the, right at the beginning was the question of the number of children who died in the schools and where were they buried. So uh, we came to call that the missing children project and it, uh, it had a number of objectives to uh, try to identify who died in the schools and how many there were as well as uh, how did they die, what did they die of, where are they buried uh, and we were not able to complete that project. First of all we weren't funded properly for it and the parties to the settlement agreement refused to provide additional funds for us to complete it but we used some of the funds that we had been provided to do the research that we did complete. You'll see in our calls to action that we are calling for the parties, including the Government of Canada, to fund a, a separate initiative to identify children who died in residential schools and to determine where they're buried. We identified by name 3,750 children approximately who died in the schools and um, we uh, had, had not and did not, chose not to contact any of the family members unless we were contacted by them to inform them about those children by name because of privacy laws that were in place at the time. But at the same time, uh, we've indicated to people if they know of any member of the family who died, they could ask if their name was on the list and we would confirm or not. Provincial coroner's offices have all committed to help and uh, British Columbia, for example, gave us a digitized copy of all of their deaths of children from uh, 1918 until 1958, uh, identified by First Nation status. Uh, and that doesn't tell us who of those children were in residential school, schools or who died in residential schools, but it's a database that you can use to cross-reference to the residential school records to determine who might have died while at a residential school or who died in the same year that they were at a residential school. And um, there is uh, also the question of a culturally appropriate burial site um, commemoration model that uh, we have recommended as part of the work that we did uh, that we say the parties should consult with First Nations leaders and elders about.
So the question of uh, apology and the importance of apology is, is interesting to talk about because um, this all started from the perspective of most Canadians when they became aware of the apology that was given by our Prime Minister in 2008 and at the top there you'll see the wording or part of the wording of the apology that was given by Prime Minister Harper on June 11th of 2008. Um, and then you'll see below it that apology that was given by the Prime Minister of Australia in 2008. So in, in the same year, within months of each other, and there's no doubt that the Canadian apology followed the model of the Australian apology, um, both nations gave apologies to their Aboriginal um, citizens for what each of those state governments had done with regard to their children over the many generations. Uh, one of the prime differences was that the state of Australia, the government of Australia, stopped at the apology. They did nothing else. So they didn't provide any compensation. They didn't create a compensation fund. They didn't provide any commemoration funding. They didn't provide any reconciliation funding. But the, um, and, and the reason for that is likely because there was no litigation that gave rise to the apology. The apology came about in Australia largely because of political pressure, political movement and political support, but in uh, Canada the apology was one that was negotiated as part of the settlement agreement and uh, while it wasn't a requirement of the settlement agreement per se, it was one that was constantly raised uh, during the course of the negotiations, we're told, as a uh, necessary requirement for the settlement agreement that was reached here, which resolved the cases. Uh, about 60,000 cases were filed in court uh, up until that point in time that uh, the apology helped to resolve and uh, lead to the settlement agreement. Uh, but it isn't just the uh, parties to the settlement agreement who have issued apologies. Apologies have come from various other institutions. This is just one example of an institution, the University of Manitoba, which apologized to survivors at a public event that we sponsored in um, uh, Nova Scotia in the fall of 2011 in which uh, they acknowledged on behalf of the President of the University of Manitoba acknowledged on behalf of the University that uh, post-secondary institutions could have and should have done more to uh, encourage its uh, academic community to take action, to raise awareness, to be more sensitive in their work to the experience of survivors in residential schools, and they didn't. But there were others, of course, who have done a great deal. Um, we estimate that probably 60,000 people have attended our national events over the course of the seven years. Um, but in addition to that, we held hearings throughout Canada in over 300 communities. Um, we have gathered together about 6,700 statements from the various survivors um, who testified to us. We've got, uh, by the time of the end of the report, about 4 million documents were collected from the government and church archives, and since then the National Centers collected an additional 2 million documents from various archives. So the total number of documents now are between 5 and 6 million. And, uh, just so you know, archival people apparently know this secondhand, but I didn't. Uh, a document is not a piece of paper. A document is a box of paper. So um, when they talk about uh, a million documents, they're talking potentially about a million boxes of documents. Now a box can hold one sheet of paper or it can hold several thousand pages of paper. So that really doesn't help you. but. Uh, they they archive them in a particular way at the archives of Canada and the various church archives and so uh, all I can tell you is that there are four million separate uh, groups of documents that we have gathered all digitized incidentally so they're all in electronic format um, that uh, are part of the collection and there's an additional two million that are becoming or are becoming part of the collection right now so it is the largest collection of uh, Aboriginal documents other than what Library and Archives Canada holds, but this is specific to residential schools.
Uh, while we were holding all of our events, both our community events, our regional events, as well as our national events, um, we webcast it. We couldn't convince any broadcaster to broadcast our events because of the costs of doing so. So we uh, undertook to webcast it and we found that uh, it was a huge success. We have sometimes had 30 to 40,000 uh, sites connected to our webcast at a, during a particular event. And each site could represent a room full of people, of course. Uh, but the um, uh, number of countries that connected to our webcasts also, in many cases, uh, w ran into the dozens. Our national uh, closing event in December of last year had over 39 countries watching our final event. So, uh, so our webcasts were very successful uh, in terms of getting the message and information out. And uh, since the close of the TRC in June, uh, since June of 2015 and since the close of the TRC, uh, over 180 uh, expressions of reconciliation have been received from uh, various organizations including Aboriginal groups, governments, churches, uh, community groups, police forces, so just about any group in society that's involved in uh, working with or having an impact on the indigenous communities have made what we call an expression of reconciliation which is basically a statement of a plan that they will engage in for the purpose of improving its relationship with the indigenous community and so those uh, statements we uh, indicated throughout the course of the summer last year as well as the fall indicated that regardless of what the governments do, that the community at large, the membership of Canadian society at large, is moving in a, into a process of uh, trying to develop a better relationship, a process of reconciliation. Honorary witnesses were a big part of our work. Uh, we gathered together some leading citizens to ask them to listen to what survivors were saying and then to use that information in order to conveyed to the public as they only they could influence um, the um, what they had learned and the importance of the message. So we had prominent people like uh, Sheila Fraser and Joe Clark, uh, Prime Minister, uh, former Prime Minister Martin, uh, former Governor General Mikhail Jean, uh, Sheila Rogers is in this photo. Um, and on the left side, uh, Ravi Weissman, who some of you may know from the Holocaust Center here in Vancouver, in, in the city of Vancouver, uh, who's quite a prominent worker with uh, getting the word out about the Holocaust experience in the Second World War. He was one of our honorary witnesses, and he, he was very useful in bringing together Holocaust survivors and residential school survivors for them to share their common experiences, and in particular the question of how to deal with the intergenerational survivors, which is one that they found very quickly they had common ground about. So it was uh, quite, a, uh, quite an important process for us to engage in. As I said, we issued an interim report in 2012 and we made a number of recommendations, particularly around the uh, findings of uh, the fact that the, the work of residential schools generally constituted a horrific assault upon culture, language and life of those who were there and that um, there were things that needed to be done to recognize the impact of that on individuals uh, as well as families and community. And we specifically focused upon the issue of mental health, the needs of mental health supports for survivors, for communities um, in our interim report. So um, that uh, and, and those recommendations we repeated in our final report as well. And in our interim report, we talked about the importance of mandatory education, about the history and legacy of residential schools, and the uh, fact that um, healing supports are needed, and that uh, also funding uh, supports were also called upon as a as a, a, a an important portion of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, but just as a general response to the uh, purpose behind residential schools being to destroy culture. We think an important purpose of recovery from that legacy is to, to help indigenous communities to restore culture as well. We also talked about the uh, issue of uh, 
the, the, uh, the fact that so many people are left out of the settlement agreement. We expect uh, that litigation will be ongoing for at least one generation for the next 20 years. I expect we'll see various uh, aspects of litigation around residential schools. Those residential schools that are not listed, as well as day schools that are not listed, day schools being those schools that operated um, at the direction of the Government of Canada with the very same purpose of cultural denial and language suppression and physical abuse and sometimes sexual abuse occurring as well. Uh, we also talked about the need for there to be an ongoing document collection process because the Government of Canada at the end of the TRC mandate had still not completed its document collection process. As I said, the, the, TRC, the National Centre has continued to collect documents after the TRC ended. Um, but there is still a legal obligation to provide those documents even though the mandate of the TRC is finished because the, the settlement agreement still continues. And uh, we also said that people need to take the United Nations Declaration seriously uh, and use it as a framework for reconciliation going forward. And so for all of you who are in the room, I encourage you all as legal scholars to take a look at the United Nations Declaration because you will see very quickly the potential it has for assisting the province and the various entities within the province to start developing a conversation both internally and externally around how to approach reconciliation going forward. Uh, in our final report we talk about uh, the fact that survivors are the real heroes of this process. They're manage, they manage to come through it and still be uh, the strong individuals, sometimes damaged, but nonetheless still stalwart in their belief that they're entitled to their identity. Uh, but at the same time, we mustn't forget about the teachers who worked in the schools uh, who really tried to help them. And in some cases, uh, we would bring together teachers and former students uh, who were still alive to uh, help them engage in a process of healing collectively so that they could uh, know that they were doing well. Uh, we had one survivor who traveled all the way to Montreal to thank one of the nuns who worked in the schools to thank her for everything that she had done. The nun was seriously ill um, and was in a, a sister's retirement home and she traveled to uh, Montreal to visit her to thank her before she left this world. Uh, to let her know that uh, despite everything that was said about the Catholic Church that she would always make sure that her good work and her good effort to protect the children was never forgotten. And so she was a constant reminder of that as we went about our work as well. And um, people always ask, well, what is the government going to do or what is it that needs to be done before uh, things are going to change? The reality is that we don't have to wait for government to take action. A lot is being done today without any government initiative being put in place. Governments need to lead, there's no question of that, municipal, federal, provincial, and Aboriginal as well. But at the same time, individual citizens and collective groups of citizens can do more, and the private industry can do more as well, changing the way they do business, changing the way they think and they talk to and about each other is uh, really important here. And we encourage people to think about what the calls to action are really all about and to figure out how it would impact <coughs> on the work that they're doing. Um, the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation is up and running and it's uh, doing good work and so I encourage people who have any questions about reconciliation or want to do work around reconciliation to be sure to stay in touch with it because even though it's still finding its own feet in still establishing its partnerships across the country. Uh, it, is, uh, it is quite uh, active in terms of informing citizens about what's going on. And uh, all of the material that we've collected, including all of the uh, items that we use in the course of our work as a commission, is also now part of the collection at the, uh, the National Center. Uh, individuals also need to inform themselves so that they're aware that this is not an Aboriginal problem, it's a Canadian one. And what we, what we mean by that is that keep in mind that 
Uh, indigenous children who went to residential schools were educated in this way to believe in their own inferiority, to believe in the superiority of the European civilizations who came here. A common theme in those schools was they were lucky that Europeans brought them education, otherwise they would fade into extinction. And that, in, in fact, was a theme that was in the public schools as well, because I went to the public school system and I can remember that being taught. But all of us were affected by what went on in public schools. and. And in the public schools that we went to, uh, we can, I'm sure, recall moments when the history of this country and the history of the world was taught in a way that extolled the virtues of the spread of European civilization and minimized, and if not, if not denigrated, the worthiness, the worthwhileness of the indigenous populations of the world, including populations in Africa, New Zealand, uh, South America and North America. And so that has created a schism between us and we, we need to overcome that through our own individual actions as well. We also need to remember that reconciliation is going to take a long time. This is not going to be an easy process and we um, require advocates, people who believe, who understand and believe in the process of reconciliation need to take up the cause of reconciliation as we go forward. Social programs are needed, of course, to address things like housing and water and uh, poor living conditions and suicide rates and health conditions, all of which are massive problems today, but you can create the healthiest people in the world and if you are still denying them their culture or not providing them access to their culture and their language, you're still going to have a problem and we need to address that and we need to make sure that it isn't part of the equation going forward. And as I said, if you thought getting to the truth was hard, and it was hard, reconciliation is going to take a long time and it's going to be even harder. But uh, keep in mind that young people get it. Young people understand almost automatically about the importance of this and easily commit to doing better. And our job, I think, as adults is to do what we can today to make it easier for the future generation coming forward. And I'd just like to play this video for you to end this presentation and, of course, open it up for questions. But I'd like you to hear what the young people say once they're informed about this story. Because we would bring them together at our events in order to let them hear what survivors had to say in a safe environment so we weren't um, putting them in a situation which compromised their own uh, sense of self and their own um, ability to handle this kind of information. But we would educate them in a safe way and then we would have them tell us what they thought of all of this. So just watch this video for a few minutes. We know that among you are the future leaders of this country. Among you are those who are going to govern this land. Among you are those who are going to make important decisions about reconciliation. And you are going to have to come to terms with this history that you're going to hear a little bit about. And we know that's a difficult process, but it all starts with three things. You must watch, you must listen, and you must show respect. It's finally nice that we realize everything and we learn about it, what really happened. My grandparents, my mom, we've been through this residential stuff, so I just really wanted to know more about it. I've learned a lot, actually, considering that my grandma didn't tell me very much or anything. So I've learned what abuse they had to go through. I've learned when it started, how long it was for, when it ended. I've learned a lot. I want to learn about what happened to my dad when he was in residential school and want to learn the healing process and what will help with it. It makes me feel kind of sad kind of for those kids because they were kind of, those torture, you know, it's not fair. It just they took like they just took them away from their homes so and they just here go to that school. I, I just didn't agree with that. It's just really wrong. It makes me upset when I think about it because just knowing what like my dad and his mom had to go through. It's really hard like to deal with, I guess. I don't know. It bothers me a lot and 
now I realize like why my dad drank so much when I was a little kid, I guess. It'll kind of change the way I think about things, like how it would like affect someone's life and their kid's life for like generations. That's one of the worst things that Canada did. I hope events like this just are able to bring closure to a lot of horrible things that happened and I hope a lot of people now recognize that the crime happened and that we need to make amends for it. I'll never forget this day because th today is the first day they ever told us about residential schools and if I ever see anyone that's Aboriginal I'll ask them if they can speak their language because I think speaking their language is a pretty cool thing. I like being around this. I like hearing the drums and seeing everybody else and learning about new nations and all these new languages I have not heard of yet. I think we should start a dance crew and start bringing back our culture, start speaking our language, and everyone should just treat each other equal. Our traditions carried on and passed down so that all our younger generations and so that my baby knows what happened in the past to her ancestors and so that she can just keep bringing our tradition forward and passing it on to her kids and their kids and everything. And I hope that something like this never happens again anywhere in the world and the importance of letting people know is so that it doesn't happen again and it's good for the younger generation to know that so that we all treat each other as equal.